Good morning, Stanton. How are you doing this morning? I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here. hope you're glad to be here, too. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to uh, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. While you're doing that, uh, let me remind you about, uh, if, you, if you're handed your uh, Game Changer card, that's a good communication piece uh, with the church, as well as uh, things that God may be speaking to you during the service. You can raise your hand when you fill that out, and we'll bring you another one, or you can just turn it in the offering plate at the end of the service. That would be great, too. Um, the, the, what you saw, a Christmas special, we've done this now twice. We, as a church, we, don't, we have not, for I don't know, several years now, we've not had a New Year's Eve service. The reason is, uh, it's not because we're anti-New Year's Eve, or excuse me, Christmas Eve service. It's not because we're anti-Christmas Eve service. Uh, we're all for that. It's just that around here, lots of churches have Christmas Eve services, and many of you who, uh, who come to Cross Church have families in other churches, so there's like a, it's a family thing a lot of times where people, families go to the family church, and so it's just something that we would compete with people like years ago, and so we just didn't have one for a long time, and so what we've done is we do something a little different. We have a Christmas special. It started last year, so this is our second annual Christmas special, um, and basically it's an hour long, and it starts from 5 p.m. on New Year's, or I keep saying New Year's Eve, from Christmas Eve through 5 o'clock on, on Christmas Day, that every hour on the hour, so you, if you, ah, oh, man, it started at 6, well, wait till 7, it'll be on again, so every hour on the hour, you can turn it on, it'll be on your, it's on our, our web page from, uh, if you go to um, thecrossmatters.org, and you can hit where it says watch live, or you can just hit put slash iCampus, it'll take you there also. And uh, if you know how to do it, you can hook it up with your TV, and you can watch it on your, like in my house, we see it on the, on the whole TV screen. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do with that. But the idea is, it's, you can sit there with your family and watch the entire I special, okay, which is something, that, or Christmas special, which is something that um, I've seen, the, I haven't seen the finished product, I've seen the outtake part of it. It's pretty funny, so you might want to watch that. All right, uh, we're continuing our series of Calvary Interrupted, and obviously it's Christmas, and uh, so Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Uh, it's Christmas, and uh, so uh, we're going to talk about the story of Mary today and how Mary's life was interrupted. Now, in the series that we've been looking at, we talked about, first of all, interrupted story, uh, interrupted need. Today we're looking at interrupted life. Um, I'm going to read the passage to you, and then I'll kind of talk you through that, and I'll jump into the outline. Luke. Luke chapter 1, I'll pick up in verse 26. Um, it starts on verse 26 with, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. So let me explain Elizabeth for a second. Elizabeth is married to Zechariah. If you read the first part of chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, um, he, he and Elizabeth were old, and they had not had a baby, and blah, 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 blah. And he'd been praying, obviously, for one, and an angel comes to him and says, hey, your prayer has been heard, and you know, you're going to have a baby. And he's like, what? And anyway, that's basically what goes on. And so Elizabeth, his 90-year-old woman, whoever it is, was now pregnant, hadn't been pregnant her whole life, couldn't, have a, couldn't conceive, and now she is. And uh, so Elizabeth, by tradition... Here, well, here's what we know for a fact. Biblically fact, we know that Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Elizabeth are related. We don't know exactly how they're related, but they are related. And so the most common way they would be related, since they are both women, would be their, their cousins. So we think they're cousins, but we don't really know that for sure. Okay? So we don't know. Okay? We just don't know. Uh, it could be a lot of relationships. Because Mary is a lot younger than people act like she is. Okay, Mary is, uh, and I'll mention that probably a little bit later, is that, so don't picture like they're not in the same age range. We're talking about in our culture, in the different culture. In our culture, we're talking about an older grandma type person, Elizabeth, who's pregnant, and a much younger teenage type person, which is Mary, who is pregnant. Okay, so when you just say, well, they're cousins, you know, John the Baptist and Jesus would be cousins, right? Well, Maybe. But they are related. We just don't know exactly what they are. So sometimes people just, you know, sometimes tradition throws things at us and we just assume, you know, like, I don't want to mess anybody up here, but December 25th is not the birthday of Jesus. It's when we celebrate the birthday of Jesus. Everybody, everybody okay with that? All right? So sometimes what happens is the, the, the Christian person says, no, it's the birthday of Jesus. And the person who's a little skeptical, he's like, no, it's not. Okay, and they, they, really, those kind of things stand in the way of the gospel sometimes. All right, so don't get religious traditions. We have a video, or a video clip we show sometimes that somebody did, 
And uh, it's probably on, you can probably go to YouTube. It's called U- Retuning, like cartooning, Retuning Christmas. And it just kind of takes some of the, the myths and some of the um, stories, you know, how we picture the manger scene, right? Is that you got the wise men and you got the shepherds all there at the same time. And, well, you know, the wise men is like two years later. Probably. Jesus is probably like a toddler when they showed up. You know, it's just, there's just things we think in our brain that may be real that's not really exactly how it is. So don't, it's, they don't make the Bible not true because the Bible doesn't say those things, right? It's how people have made it look or how they have created pictures, you know. Like the, the picture we have of Jesus, like when I say picture Jesus in your brain, that a lot of us have a picture we have, that's probably nothing like what Jesus looked like, okay? If it has him looking kind of girlish, I guarantee you that wasn't right, right? Because that boy is all man. I'm just letting you know, right? Because well, that's a different message. Okay, now, so Elizabeth is in her sixth month of being pregnant. God sent an angel Gabriel to Nazareth, the town of Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Now, this is where the age thing comes in a little bit. How we process this in our culture, this is making Joseph get ready to be a pedophile, okay? <laughs> Jason's about to spit his coffee out. In their culture, okay, understand this, in their culture, somewhere in the neighborhood of 12, then you went through the, the, the process of being betrothed. What that would be is that somewhere in the neighborhood of 12, there'd be the man who'd make the deal with the, the girl's family, okay? And, okay, whatever the price was, you know, so many camels or whatever, whatever the deal was, right? And it started at 12-ish, and then it would take about a year before the girl actually went to the residence of the man. Everybody tracking so far? Okay, so Mary is having Jesus. Most likely, now once again, you don't have to get betrothed at 12. Maybe she was 15 when that happened. We doubt that. Okay, I mean, just that's probably not what happened. But in their culture, that at 12, her, a, a man, Joseph, would have, and maybe it was already prearranged ahead of time. Maybe it's one of those we're all family friends, we love each other, and this is what's going to happen. Who knows how it went down? But basically, Joseph would have made a deal with Mary's family, and this is going to be my wife, and they say, okay, great. And then they started somewhere in the neighborhood at 12, and a year later from that point, they'd be in what we call engaged, basically. They'd be, you know, she's, she's legally married to him at that point, but she's not going, she can't, she doesn't move in with him until at, after a year. That's kind of their process. So Mary probably had Jesus somewhere in the neighborhood of 13 or 14 years old, which we're going, excuse me? But that was their culture, okay? That's what they did. Um, let's see, in the town of Galilee, verse 27, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, the virgin's name was Mary. The angel of the Lord came and he said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now that phrase, highly favored, it's, what it really means in the Greek is that God has shown grace upon you. In words like, the fact that I'm even coming to you in the first place, this is grace. This is God. This is God showing you favor. He's showing you grace. Um, and he's going to be with you. Mary's first response, which makes sense, because you know, don't picture her as the you know, 25-year-old businesswoman who's trying to settle down now. This is a, you know, 12, 13-year-old girl who has now had an angel come and visit her. And in their culture, women were property. Like, it, it, uh, a woman, like, her, her testimony had no value. Like, if, if five women said it's blue and one man says, nope, it's green, in the court of law, it's green. Right? That was the culture they lived in. So now this girl who's, you know, if she's the most confident 12 or 13-year-old you've ever met in your life, she's 12 or 13 years old, and the angel has a physical appearance in front of her, okay? No wonder she's terrified. Um, she's, uh, verse 29, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting must this be in words, what's going to happen next? The angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God, which goes back to the word grace again. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth. Immediately she's thinking, whoa, 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 what did you just say? Right? You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, we've heard this story, you know, lots of times. 
But put yourself in the position of the 12 or 13 year old little girl who's hearing this in the moment and how overwhelming the situation must have been. How many questions, the, the level, just having an angel standing in front of you, how freaky weird would that be? Mary says in verse 34, how can this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am still a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the one to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is, who is said to be unable to conceive in her, is in her sixth month. No word from God will ever fail. Verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. So let me kind of talk you through that just for a second before I jump in the outline. So you got this situation. You guys picture, you know, the little girl. You got Mary. Or you got the angel. I don't know how you picture angels. I picture them really big, you know, tall and you know, this is Gabriel, so he's like one of the head doll, you know, ding dong guys. He's a big deal. So I'm thinking, okay, this is a pretty serious situation, very intimidating probably for her. She's processing it. The first thing you, she had, she had to hear what he said, and then she, it's natural to question that, right? When God speaks to you, it's, you're going to question it. And this, this will apply here, here a little bit in the service. It, you're going to question whatever God says when it's something this big. Like, that can't happen. That is not possible to happen. God does not mind you questioning him. Questioning God is a natural part of processing. Okay, because sometimes people think, well, th th sometimes we're raised in environments that are abusive, spiritually abusive. And a spiritually abusive environment will say, you can't question God. And sometimes how that's applied is this. The spiritual authority says, God said, and you can't question God. There's been lots of damage done over the years over that. Lots and lots and lots and lots of damage. It's like, well, the person in charge of the church said, sometimes it's within your family. It's the, it's the, it's the patriarch or matriarch in your family that said, a person saying, I had a pastor friend one time, well, I was worked on anything. He thought that if he thought it, it must be God and therefore, everybody else was supposed to rally around that, okay? Well, there are a lot of things he thought that wasn't God. It didn't make him even bad, it just meant, so how I process that is, that if something is God, God's job is to put, give a spiritual gift of faith, a, super, a supernatural gift of faith to the people who are hearing, and their jobs to respond to that. That's the whole pray and obey thing that we use around here a lot, right? Mary is just processing through this, and she heard something that was crazy. It's okay to question God. God's not upset with that. I mean, there's a different kinds of question, though. There's the question as in, I'm not, I, I, I'm tent to disobey, or I, you know, you, you have to prove it or make me. And there's the question, God, of I want to obey you. I, I just need to know for sure it's really you. Those are two, completely two different mindsets. The, the mindset you want to develop is, I'm going to obey. As soon as I know it's God, I will obey. I just really need to know it's God. Okay. So Mary approached God that way. That was her, I mean, she, her, her attitude's not bad. She just, how can this be? I don't understand this. So then God gives her a promise. To, and it's really kind of a two-fold promise. The one is, is that there's nothing that I'm gonna say, verse 38 is where it comes from. I'll, I'll get this later. There's nothing I'm gonna say that's impossible. Every word that comes from my mouth is, is, is got the power, contains the power to accomplish that. He says, no word from God, or nothing is impossible. God, ever heard your translation says, that, first of all, that's true. That if I say it, it's gonna happen. And second of all, you know that 90-year-old relative of yours that hasn't been pregnant her whole life because she can't get pregnant? Uh-huh. She's with a child right now. Oh. So when the story ends, the very first thing that Mary does, I mean, if you want to keep reading the story, the very first thing she does, when I stopped in verse 38, she takes off in verse 39, the very first thing is she runs to Elizabeth's house. So we're going to read this here. Verse 38, she says, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. 
She's agreeing with whatever God has said then, right? And then it says the angel left her. At that time, verse 39, because it's not part of the message, just side note. Mary got ready and hurried out of town. Now, here's what took place. Mary has just had the angel experience. She's like, all right, I can do this. Whatever you want, God, I'm all for it. As soon as the angel's gone, she is heading out of town to Elizabeth's house. Now, why is she doing that? Is it possible that the reason that she was heading to Mary's house was she had just heard the angel said that the 90-year-old woman who can't get pregnant is now six months pregnant. See, you, if you're six months pregnant, I don't know if you know this or not, we can tell. <laughs> right? I mean, if you're, if you're like, if it had been like, Elizabeth is pregnant. She got pregnant two days ago. Like, yeah, we don't know that. Right? But if you're six months pregnant, the moment that Mary walks into Elizabeth's pregnant, uh, pregnant presence, she will recognize that she's pregnant. Right? See, God, God wasn't upset with her for questioning him. God gave her a promise that said, listen, I'm telling you something. If I say it, I can do it. But then he turned right around with that in the same sentences and said, let me give you some evidence of my greatness. The woman who's never been pregnant in her entire life, who cannot have any children, who is way past childbirthing age. She's now pregnant. She's pregnant six months. Why don't you go see with your own eyes? And immediately, Mary went and checked it out. So Mary's faith is based on what God said, but it's also based on what God gave her the ability to see. A confirmation process. So when God speaks and God asks you to do something significant, when he interrupts your life, because that's what we're going to be talking about today, is when God interrupts your life, most of the time when it's God, it's bigger than you can believe. That's just a fact. It really is. But God, many times, maybe most of the time, but many times at least, especially when you're early in the process of your spiritual development, then God will also give you something that confirms what he's saying. Now, pause that for a second because in the story of Zechariah, which again is not part of the message really, but just, just kind of side information for you to know. Zechariah was an old man. He's one of the ones that burned the incense in the, at the altar inside, and he's one of the priests that can only go in and whatever. And he was a much more mature person, right? He questioned the angel. Angel comes to him and says, Hey, your wife's going to get pregnant. He does the same thing. He was terrified. Whoa, what's this about, right? And then he says, uh, How can this be? And here's what happened to him. You can, you can read it later if you want to. The angel says, uh, because you didn't trust me, or because you didn't believe me when I told you something, you won't be able to speak till it happens. And Zechariah's ability to speak was immediately taken away. Now, he, Mary said exactly the same thing. What was the difference? You got an old man who had walked with God for a long time, who knew the promises of God, who had been praying that God would give him a child. I mean, God, because usually you've lost hope at a certain point, right? He had obviously not lost hope. God had been birthing, now he would not understand it this way, but God had been stirring in him to ask to believe for a child. He, he's too old, his wife's too old, but God had been working because the angel says, God has answered your prayers. So he had been actively praying for this to actually take place. The angel shows up and says, this is already taking place. This is going to take place, I mean. And immediately his question of, whoa, whoa, whoa how can that be, is one of doubt that was beyond. He, he should have been above that. On the other hand, you got a little girl. She ain't praying for that. She's not trying to be pregnant. She's just... I'm, I'm in the process of being engaged and I'm, I'm committed to this guy that I'm still living in mom and dad's home, but at, at some point in time, in a, within the next however many months it would be, within a year, I go and live at this guy's house. You know, so she's not thinking about giving birth to the Messiah, right? That's not her prayer. She's completely interrupted, right? So like Zechariah, he's begging to be interrupted. You know, he's, he's pleading with God for a child, you know, please interrupt my world and give us a child. Mary's like about doing about her own her business, man. She's taking care of whatever she takes care of in her daily life and just being Mary and being a 12 or 13 or 14 year old girl. And God completely interrupts her. 
And so when the man who, the person, he's a man, the man, the person who's older, spiritually more mature, had walked with God for a long time, when they questioned God, God still fulfilled his promise. But there was some discipline that came with it because he should have been beyond the issue of doubt. When Mary, the little girl, had a very similar situation happen, childbirth when you can't conceive and childbirth when you're a virgin are equally the same kind of miracles. But she was completely taken back by it. And when she asked, it's God's shown grace towards you. Here, let me just give you some more information. Elizabeth, she's pregnant. Sometimes we have to recognize where we are in our spiritual development process. And I always use this paradigm like, you know, that's as far away from God as you can get, that's as close to God as you can get, that's kind of how we do it up here. And, uh, and I always come back up here and you know, wherever you are in the process and this journey, right? Well, if you're here, God expects more from you than when you were back there. And if you're here, God doesn't expect the same thing he does when you're up here. What happens many times is the person who's been walking with God a little longer, it has nothing to do with age, don't get caught up in age. I, I've known some teenagers, they're way more spiritually mature, not necessarily financially more mature or relationships more mature or you know, emotionally more mature, but I've known teenagers who are spiritually far more mature than adults are, right? So this is not about age, this is about spiritual development, spiritual maturity. Right, because whenever you come to Christ, I don't care how old you may be. You know, if you're the 50 year old man, you come to Christ that day. You are a baby in Christ. You don't know. I mean, you may be mature spiritually or emotionally, and mature mentally, and mature relationally, and mature financially. But you're not necessarily mature spiritually speaking, right? But the more spiritually mature that you get, you become, is the more God expects. Like your faith shouldn't be rattled as easy. You shouldn't fall to temptation as easy. You shouldn't use the same lame excuses to justify wrong behaviors or wrong emotions or wrong whatever the way that you used to would have. Spiritual development is not how long I've been going to church and how old I am, how many businesses I own. Spiritual development is the work of the Spirit of God inside of you, washing you and cleansing you from the inside out, making you the person that God has called you to be. And you can be 70 years old, be a pastor of a church, and be spiritually immature. You can be 13 years old, be all confused about what life is about, and have higher spiritual maturity than the adults around you. So how would you evaluate your level of spiritual maturity? Because see, if I'm struggling, and how the best way to do that is, what do I struggle with? I mean, when God asks me to do something that's God's size, how, do I, how does that affect me? Well, what if God asks me to do something small? How does that affect me? How about how I manage my, like I say, my emotions and my cravings and those things in my life that are, you know, my fears, my worries, my doubt? I mean, I don't mean this to be ugly. I'm just trying to help you understand, right? You cannot be a spiritually mature person. Now, you can teach the Bible, you can be a whatever, pastor of a church again. But you cannot be a spiritually mature person and also be a gossip. You can't be a spiritually mature person and still worry, deal with worry. Whoa, 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 now you're, listen, worry is the absence of trust in God. I'm just telling you. I'm not being ugly, I'm just, you just need to understand that we, we justify things. We think, okay, because I'm the pastor of a church, I am therefore spiritually mature. No, that's not what makes you spiritually mature. That means that there are some people that chose to vote for me to be the pastor of the church. And I, choose, and, I, and I function in such a way that I continue to be the pastor of the church. That's, you know, that's, that's what that means. That doesn't mean I'm spiritually mature. You, you can't be spiritually mature and have struggles maintaining your emotions. You say, well, Tim, you shouldn't say this stuff. I know. It's like, well, 
That, yeah, I can. No, you can't. Because, see, that's about self-discipline. Well, I'm just a little high strung, and that's called an excuse. Yeah, but they pushed my buttons, and that's called justification. See, spiritual maturity is about spiritual development. It's about less of me and more of Jesus in me. It's me dying to me so that Christ can live through me. And the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you, he's not struggling with the things that you struggle with in your flesh. See, my issue with my anger, or my issue with my worry, or my issue with my doubt, or my issue with my temptation, those are all in my flesh. Every one of those are in my flesh. Is that fair to everybody? Everybody gets that, right? So when you push my button, and I get a response, you get a response out of me, right? Where's the button I say located at? That's an issue in my flesh, right? The Holy Spirit didn't have a button like that. You can't push the Holy Spirit's button and him, right? You can't push the Holy Spirit's button and him, you know, get depressed on you. That's not how that works. And so the outside world watching, okay, we just kind of go into church world, right? And they see people, well, they're a, you know, a leadership in the church, but they're mean as a snake. They're a leadership in the church, they lie. They're a leadership in the church, and they do, they, do un, they do illegal business activity or unethical business activities. They, they're a member of a church, or they're a, they're a leader in a church, and, and they're the biggest gossip in town, or whatever the case is. People see that stuff, See, our job is about spiritual development. Mary's a little kid, and she knew the process. God said it, and, and she went through this thing. Of, I heard it. I questioned it. But she questioned from a heart of obedience, not of rebellion. And then she confirmed it, went through the process of confirming it. So what happens when God speaks to you in a way that rattles your cage? It may not be, hey, you're gonna be the mother of Messiah. Maybe it's, hey, you know what? It's time for you to get over that one thing you keep fighting. It's time for you to give me this area of trust. It's time for you to choose to be faithful financially, or it's time for you to choose to be faithful with this area of your life, or it's time for you to get past that area of addiction or that area of struggle or that unforgiveness. It's time for you to deal with this, because that's no different. Right? So let's just pause a second for a second. Let's just say now, it's you, me, standing here, right? And the angel of the Lord appears. Well, the angel of the Lord is not going to appear to me and say, Tim, you're going to give birth to the Messiah. <laughs> that's already happened, right? That, that, somebody else has already done that thing, right? That's not what he's going to do to me. Maybe he's going to appear to me and say, you know, it, it's time for you to get past this issue. It's time for you to forgive that situation. It's time for you to overcome. It's time for you to let me set you free from the captivity you've been in. Now, then in my brain, I go, what? But you don't know what they did to me. You don't understand what that's like. You see, that's the same thing Mary said, except it was a different situation. Are you tracking with me? So the angel's not gonna appear to me. I mean, I mean it's not like he can't, but... I don't need, I mean, I, I, probably, I probably will not have a physical angel show up and see me. But the Spirit of God does speak to me. And the Spirit of God does speak to you. See, when Mary was in this situation, the Holy Spirit did not live inside of Mary. Okay, she's just a person and she's living. And God on the outside proved himself to her. He spoke to her from the outside, right? Now, he gave her, this is a visual evidence that this is God speaking, not her thoughts. Because she didn't have a, comp a comprehension of the whole Holy Spirit living inside of you and the Spirit of God speaking. She didn't comprehend that stuff, right? In my world, the Holy Spirit lives inside of me because I know Christ my Savior. He speaks to me. If you know Christ your Savior, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, he wants to speak to you, right? As the Holy Spirit speaks to you, he will say things that will be in keeping with the nature and the character of God, things we need to get over with, things we get past, things we need to deal with, areas of our life that will be like far before, because what we want to do is let me do the really big cool thing. Like, I would love to be the mother of Jesus, okay? I would love to be the pastor of a large church. I would love to be the guy who could give millions of dollars away to charity. Okay, long before you get to there, there's the stuff that nobody will ever know about that God's saying, will you let me sandpaper off this rough edge in your life?
Will you choose to trust me in this one area that I'm challenging you with today? Will you choose to believe me and obey me in this one area that I'm asking you to believe me and obey me in today? See, we all think that if I got the big thing, I'd be faithful. That is not how it works. The more you get, the more opportunities you get, the more things you see God do in your life, is the more difficult it is to be faithful to what God has done. That's what the Bible says. If you can't be faithful with a little, he's not gonna give you much. What, did I use tithing, for instance, because you don't have money? If you can't tithe when you don't have anything, you're, you're not gonna tithe when you have a lot. It's harder. I mean, if you had $10, that's all you make. You know, you know all, all it makes $10. If you can't write the tithe check for a dollar, what makes you think you can write a tithe check when it's $10 million and you write the check for a million? Oh, that's a lot of money. I'm just telling you, that's how it works. It, it, it's about an issue that you resolve internally inside of you. If you can't forgive one person for the thing they did to you, how are you gonna forgive all the people who do something to you? I mean, just pick the topic. It doesn't matter what we're picking. Long before God uses you to do something great, God will work in you to do things that no one's ever gonna notice. They're so small, they seem so trivial. That's a part of the process. What happens behind the scenes and no one sees is way more important than what happens in front of everybody that everybody gets to see. In the outline, number one, God interrupts those he favors. God interrupts those he favors. Again, the word favor, that, that phrase in the Greek is shows grace upon, okay? That God actually gave grace to interrupt you. In other words, like, it's a cool thing that God interrupted you. You know what I'm saying? That's what, that's what that means. It's like that when God interrupts you, that's really a great moment is what it means. Okay, here's a phrase you might want to write down. It, it helps me understand this. Um, the level of a relationship determines the level of interruption, the level of relationship determines the level of interruption. So you're doing what you're doing at home and the stranger, the doors, the, 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 the door-to-door salesperson, right, interrupts you. You don't like that, right? That irritates you, right? Uh, the person who you don't really, like they're kind of a stranger to you or whatever it is, the person you don't like very much, they interrupt you. I don't like that very much. But then when somebody close to you interrupts you, you don't even think about being an interruption. Like when my kids come and interrupt me, I don't even think about that. Like, I, I may, like when you interrupt me, I may not tell you that I'm, up for, I'm, I'm bugged that you interrupted me, right? I'll just be like, you know, do what I gotta do. My kids walk in, I don't even consider being an interruption. Doesn't even cross my mind they interrupted me. So I think about it, right? I create space that they ought to be able to come into my world anytime they want to, and if they can't, there's a problem. That's how I think about it, okay? So they can interrupt any meeting they want to interrupt. They can walk into any moment they want to walk into. If my kids need me, they walk in, and that's the way it's going to be, and I don't even think about being an interruption. But then someone that's just a nuisance, let's say, and they come in the exact same moment, how do I think about that? I'm frustrated I'm trying to get rid of them, whatever the words are, right? Okay, so those are your extremes. How does it, when God interrupts you? I mean, you have your schedule for the day. You have your schedule for the week. You have your schedule for the year. You have your life completely planned out, let's say. And then God, time out, here's what I wanna do with you. You know how you're gonna spend your money. And God says, time out, I have a plan. You know how you're going to evolve, you know, whatever the thing is, you know how you're going to do the thing, and then God says, eh, time out, I got something else I wanna do in you. I got, I got something I wanna stir you to obey me and respond to me. And it's gonna change your plans for you. See, the level of frustration that I have over an interruption from God is a direct relationship to the level of relationship I have with him. Everybody tracking? You guys out there? All right, so the, the point is, is just like with my children and someone who irritates me, 
Okay, I'm doing exactly the same thing. My little girl walks in, no problems at all. The person who irritates me walk in, like, and immediately I feel things, let's say. What's the difference? Relationship, right? The buddy calls you and says, hey, can you help me? Yeah, I'll be right there. Sometimes other people call you. Can I help me? I, no, I, I, I got to go. I got stuff coming over. I got, I got stuff happening. No, I can't go. What's the difference? Relationship. The person that can walk into your house at midnight and you invite them right on in and don't think a thing about it. The person that comes and knocks on the door politely at, you know, 7 o'clock and you get irritated with. What's the difference? It's all relationship. God interrupts those he favors. If God never interrupts you, if God never engages you in some way outside your normal routine, it's not a compliment. That means God doesn't love you unconditionally. What it means is, is that he probably knows you're gonna say no. Like if I need you, let's say that um, there are times I have needs. And many times when I have a need, it's happening at a time that uh, I can't fix it myself. Like I, can't, I can't do anything about this. Right? I mean, I've had crazy things. I've had, you know, my, if, I'm gonna, if my wife's gonna have car trouble, it will happen right when I get ready to drive out of town. You know, that kind of stuff, right? It's just things that, I, they need to be fixed right now, but I can't, I can't be there to manage the situation. All right? So if I have a need at two o'clock in the morning, right? And my phone has lots of phone numbers in it. Now, just think about who I would call in that moment. It's not just the first letter that shows up in the alphabet, right? It's the person that I think that I have enough relationship with that they won't kill me if I call them at two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> right? I'm calling the person that I think will respond. Like, they'll help me, <laughs> you know? And I'm passing by numbers who, they, they won't help me. Isn't that right? Right? Like, so if, if I'm going through the, you know, if I'm going through your letters in the alphabet, right, my phone, I'm Rolodex, and, right, and I pass your name, why would I pass your name? Either because you can't fix the problem or I don't know that you would even respond to me. So when I stop at your name and I call you, it's really a compliment of what I think about our relationship that I would call you and say, I know it's two o'clock in the morning or I know it's, in, I know it's really awkward time, but I, here's my situation, here's what I need and I can't do it without you, can you help me please? Everybody tracking? So when God chooses to interrupt my life, or when God chooses to interrupt your life, it's really a compliment that he thinks that he, he, he has enough relationship with us and that he trusts us enough that we're gonna respond to him the way he wants us to respond. When God doesn't interrupt our lives, when we see him interrupt the lives of the people around us, when, you know, as a church family, it is a compliment when God stretches us. It's a compliment when God throws things in our laps that are bigger than us. It's a compliment, you know, whether it be the new campus stuff like the Staunton campus or whether it be hiring staff members that we can't afford, whether it be, whether it be building new buildings or having moments like this Sunday, this is a measuring more Sunday and, and hopefully you've been praying about that and you know, you've, you're obeying whatever God's spoken to you and how to give in that, in that area. But, but it's, it's a compliment when God stretches us out of our comfort zone. When God asks us for something that we cannot do without him. Or when God asks us for something that frustrates us because it, it, I had a schedule, I had a plan, I had, I, this stuff was already predetermined. And then all of a sudden God wants to reallocate my time or reallocate my money or reallocate my whatever. It's actually a compliment when God does that. It's just God's way of saying, I trust you. Number two in the outline, divine interruptions are an invitation to experience God. Divine interruptions are an invitation to experience God. I've been kind of talking about that already a little bit. 
It's like, come see how I do things. You know, like I, I talk to people all the time, right? I talk to pastors too. And their churches don't go through anything like our church goes through. Never does. They don't get stretched. They're not asked to do things they can't afford. They're not asked to do things they don't have enough manpower to accomplish. They never get asked to do that kind of stuff. Now, let me tell you how, the, let me tell you how it plays out, okay? How they look at me is that I'm not quite psychologically okay. Okay? And some even think that makes me a manipulator or that makes me a cult leader or whatever they would say. All right? Because they're doing everything right. I mean, all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed. They sing good hymns or nice songs, right? They dress appropriately. They have nice buildings. They, they preach biblical messages. But they're not growing. They're not reaching anybody. Lives aren't being changed and transformed at their church. Right? But then over Tim's church, they do all kinds of weird stuff over there. You know, and they get by with it, and the church keeps growing, and they keep reaching people, and there's people getting saved, and I mean... We have a tendency to think that how we do it is right. Rather than go by how, what God does. It makes any sense. Like when we throw up on, on say, Facebook, uh, a grace story video or, you know, whatever it is. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't tell people our stats and I don't, I don't tell those stories very often, but if we do those kind of things, you'd think that every pastor in the world all like that. You know, that's an awesome story. They all share that. I mean, a story of God's trans transforming somebody's life. We all, we all share that out, you know, forever. Almost none. Matter of fact, most of the time, zero. Why would that be? I mean, I could go to the stories for a long time. So now, let's get off that level and talk about just the personal level. I mean, what do you think people are thinking about Mary? I mean, let's say she, you know, 13 years old, whooped out her cell phone and started texting her best friends. An angel came to see me. <laughs> You're right. And, uh, I'm going to have the Messiah. They're rejecting her because everybody knows that either you and Joseph are doing stuff that you're saying you're not doing or you've been doing it with someone else. Why is that? Because that's not their normal. Because in their normal, that's how it works, right? Mary's normal is different because her and God got relationship. She's highly favored. She's got the grace of God. It's a different relationship. I mean, just think about how we see things. She would have been, I mean, even Joseph, I mean, if you read the rest of the story, even Joseph, because Joseph knows what he's not doing. And he's like, okay, how did that happen to her? Did she just make up a story? I mean, she just lied. And he had to go away for a while to figure it out. I mean, that's what, if you read the story. He had, it wasn't like, oh yeah, no problem. The angel of the Lord had to talk to him too. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, this is the real deal, brother. Whew, okay. So Joseph was able to buy into Mary's story because he had, he had a very similar experience, right? Mary has an angel. She's like, ah, oh, this is crazy, right? But it's so real, so she buys in. Those out who don't have the same experience, they're rejecting her, they're judging her, they're making fun of her, right? Joseph is like, I don't know what to do about that. He has an angel. He has a similar experience. He gets spoken to by God. And it's like, okay, because my experience is similar to your experience, I'm going to stand with you. I got it. When God interrupts you, he is inviting you to experience him and his way of doing things. The awkward feeling you have sometimes is because you're getting separated from the ones he doesn't interrupt. So if we're all together 
and God interrupts me and invites me to experience in him and something that I ain't okay, that I've never done or whatever, right? I step out in that. My, my group doesn't get that experience. So when I step out, it's not I don't believe in God. It's not I don't want to have faith in God. I don't want to trust God. These people start making fun. These people start casting doubt. These people start saying, oh, you'll change. You'll come back eventually. You'll stop. Oh, I'm going to stop these bad habits. I'm going to get out with my bad habits and start doing these things. And they're going back here saying, yeah, yeah, you're coming back. The reality is we need to live a life of experiencing God because those people who are watching us, they need to experience God. We have to be faithful to church. You know why? Because there are countless churches watching us. The lie that you can't grow a church in a small town. The lie that people don't want to come to Christ anymore. I mean, go through the whole list of stuff. If we crash and burn today, then all of that group keeps saying, see, I told you, it's dangerous out there. Stay right here where it's comfortable. But every day, every year, that God proves faithful and we prove obedient and we just keep doing what God called us to do as individuals as a church, those who watch us have to make a choice. And maybe eventually, God will interrupt their life and he'll call them out. I have more to say about that, but I gotta go. Number three, I've already been kind of talking about this a little bit. Uh, divine interruptions create tension until we resolve these, accept it. Divine interruptions create tension until, until we resolve to accept it. It's, it, it's, it. it's natural, okay? Like, how can this be? This is crazy. This can't happen. That's a tension, right? I'm, I'm gonna make a fool of myself. I'm gonna look dumb. They're gonna make fun of me. They're gonna reject me. That, those are tensions, right? And if, if you're gonna worry about that tension, it will drive you crazy, until you resolve to accept it. I mean, like if I just hand out, and I've used this illustration a lot, there are some of you who wear Christian t-shirts on a regular basis, or you wear cross church shirts or whatever on a regular basis. If you do that, you had to get past the worry about doing that, okay? There's others of you that if I gave you a Christian t-shirt of some nature that was very clearly Jesus or very clearly cross church and said, you wear this, you'd be terrified to put that on and go to the ball game. Or you'd be terrified to put that on and go to wherever you was gonna go to. I mean, I know grown men who have wore their shirt when they're out doing some stuff, and then when they're going to go, they went home and changed and went and did some other stuff because who was going to be there? See, there was a tension that they weren't really comfortable with representing Christ or church or whatever. They weren't comfortable with that. So it was a tension. So until you accept the tension, just accept it. Well, what if God asks you? What if he interrupts your life and asks you to do something crazy? What if he asks you to start tithing? What if he asks you to start inviting people to come to church? Well, if you got to start inviting, asking you to invite people to come to church, right? It's uh, until you just get past and accept the tension. It's okay. They, they may say no, and it's really no big deal. It, it, it's, not, it's not a problem, or whatever the case may be. And number four, every word from God contains the power to accomplish it. Every word from God contains the power to accomplish. That's, that's that verse 38, uh, actually verse 37, where it says, no word from God will ever fail, or it, it really, it can be translated better, no word from God is without power. The best way to translate would be that every single word that God speaks contains the power to accomplish what it said. As a church, that's what we believe as an individual, some of you believe that. Some of you don't. See, the difference is, is that when we're back here someplace and God invites us, he interrupts us and invites us to come after him, he invites us to experience his ways or whatever he's trying to accomplish, when you step out and do that, there's gonna be a tension. And what resolves the tension is when you decide that every word that comes from the mouth of God contains the power to accomplish it. God didn't say it's going to be easy. But see, you have to stand on something. If I stand on the culture around me, I'm going to run back. If I stand on my emotions, if I stand on what people say, if, if I stand on some kind of, you know, whatever the word is, you know, where everything's going really good in my direction, looks very successful, if, you, if that's what you stand on, you're going to fail and you're going to go back. But when you stand on God's word, I don't mean the Bible, I mean the word that God speaks to you. And God's gonna confirm it. God's gonna give you supernatural faith to believe. God's gonna give you the eyes to see the confirmations around you. 
But when you stand where God asks you to stand, and you endure whatever he asks you to do and persevere through that, God is always faithful. So when I stand where I stand at today, and I talk to friends of mine, people who attend our church, pastor friends of mine or whoever, where I stand is based on God interrupting me countless times and inviting me to experience him. And I haven't always been faithful. But as I've chosen to obey him, to surrender and choose humility, and just like Mary said, you know, then may your will to me be done. Then I have seen God prove himself over and over and over and over again. And the biggest argument I have with people many times, including pastors, is intellectual. It's not life-based. It's not what the Spirit of God is doing or saying. It's up here because that's where all their excuses are. That's where their fear is at. That's where their distrust is at. And if you remember in the Garden of Eden, that's what Satan said. You know, there's the tree of life and there's a tree of knowledge. Today, people who worship Satan would tell you that the greatest, the greatest power in the world is knowledge. That's what they tell you today. If God has been interrupting you, I want you to be encouraged. And maybe where we are as a church family, my guess is some of you have been interrupted. So you guys riled your cage a little bit. I mean, there's some things we need to be doing as individuals in the church family that is not gonna be easy. It'll be supernatural. It'll be amazing. It's God interrupting us to invite us to experience his way of doing things. If God hasn't been interrupting you, I'm gonna ask you to begin to pray just like Zechariah prayed earlier in chapter one. He prayed for a baby. I wanna ask you to pray that God would interrupt you. Because he interrupts those who he favors, who he wants to show grace to. I'm gonna ask you to dive into your relationship with him. If you want God to interrupt you, become the kind of person who says yes. Become the kind of person that he knows that you're gonna say yes. He knows that when he's going through his little Rolodex, he can stop on your name, he can call you because you're gonna say yes every time. And as you become that kind of person, you'll see God do a lot more things in your life. Let's pray. Dear Father, um, there are so many things that, uh, ways that a message like that can be applied to our lives. It's just, God is just unlimited. Guys, we want you to interrupt us. On the other hand, we don't want you to interrupt us because it, it, it gets messy and it, it, it ruins our routines and it, it changes our, our life plans and, and we hate that. On the other hand, God, we want you to interrupt us because we want to see you be God and we want to experience you and know for sure that you're real and all that stuff. God, I thank you for the tension between our flesh and your spirit that until we resolve it, God, I thank you for the tension that just keeps making us uncomfortable. Father, for this room, for those who are watching right now on our I campus and for those who are on our Staunton campus and watching, God, I, uh, I pray that you have hand delivered the message that you wanted that person to hear. The exact, not words I spoke, but the exact application they need to hear. The exact emotion that they need to feel the exact stirring that they needed to experience. But may we be a church who looks forward to your interruptions. So just now I pray, amen.